Thanks everyone for joining. I'd like, uh, my name is Christy. I'm from the Hypothesis team. If you haven't seen me in another session so far, we're happy to have you here. Um, and I am happy to introduce um, Brian O'Connor, who joins us from the Institute of Writing and Rhetoric at Dartmouth College. And uh, Brian is going to pre be presenting social annotation and first year writing, increasing engagement and demystifying analysis with instructional text. So I'm excited to hear what he has to share. Uh, you should be able to access the chat and the Q&A if you have questions throughout the session. So please feel free to pop your questions in either one of those places. Um, and if you are OK with it, Brian, I will pass it off to you. Uh, yes, I am. Sorry. I'm being challenged by the uh, sharing my screen and getting my notes on a separate screen and stuff. Um, I'm sorry. And let me just make this full screen and raise this up a little bit. All right. Does that look okay? Yep. All Looks right. good Thank to you. me. Okay. Awesome. All right, everybody. Um, uh, like Christy said, and thank you for the introduction. My name is Brian O'Connor. Uh, I teach first year writing uh, in the uh, the writing program at Dartmouth College. Um, the current academic year is just my second year here. So a lot of what I'm talking about today is actually me coming up with ways to adjust to changes teaching here from my previous institution. Um, I had spent the previous 12-ish uh, years teaching at IU Bloomington, uh, a, a range of courses, um, all writing focused from um, um, First year writing to professional writing to uh, kind of advanced uh, literary analysis with a, a writing intensive component. Um, so I'm excited to uh, have this opportunity to share with you a few uses of social annotation that I've recently tried in my class. And also to hopefully hear from you along the way, um, either some ideas uh, uh, that you've been working with or have implemented that kind of dovetail with what I'm discussing or any ideas or suggestions you might have for how I might improve some of the things that I'm, I'm talking about here. So um, the big picture, so in the fall of 2023, I began using hypothesis and social annotation tasks to turn selections from my first year writing classes textbook into interactive workspaces. Uh, I'd been using hypothesis pretty regularly since 2020 uh, when we had to uh, go, go teach on Zoom with the pandemic. And I've been using hypothesis ever since pretty heavily, but usually in just fairly conventional um, kind of annotation tasks. Uh, but in fall 2023, I kind of tried to use the platform more robustly for what it could offer and kind of stretch myself as to how I had thought about how, how I could use this, this, this platform. So in this presentation, um, I'm going to cover some background on the course that I implemented this in, um, describe the observed trends that led to the creation of these workspaces, highlight features of these workspaces and the thinking behind them, and then just kind of briefly discuss the results of the workspaces and, and what I might do moving forward. So for some background, uh, I teach composition and research one and two, and um, I, I've already mentioned this, but I'll, I'll say it again. So in the 2022-2023 academic year was A, my first year in this position at Dartmouth, B, my first time teaching first year writing in many years, and C, my first time going back to like using a required textbook and really engaging with that textbook as the primary text for our course. Um, we read and analyze fiction, we read and analyze film, we read and analyze uh, scholarly articles and theoretical texts, but um, all of those were kind of billed to my students as kind of secondary uh, objects on which to practice the, the main skills being discussed in our, our central text, which was our, our textbook. Um, so some features of this course, it meets for two consecutive quarters. So Dartmouth is on the quarter system and coming from IU Bloomington, which is squarely in the semester system and trying to kind of rethink how I do first year writing in, in, in a 10 week uh, term, um, even though I have two of them, I still had to think in kind of 10 week chunks uh, was really a challenge, right? So this, this course that I teach teaches, it meets over two consecutive quarters. And while it's two different classes and each class re receives a grade, it's billed as kind of like a single block. So like students kind of sign up for the two course sequence. So I see the same um, students for two consecutive terms there with me for two consecutive terms. And we get to spend kind of 20 weeks together rather than um, 10 weeks. So in composition and research one, 
uh, I tend to emphasize analytical reasoning and resolving interpretive difficulties through close reading. Um, and then in composition research too, uh, it really provides students with the opportunity to apply the previous terms strategies to their own kind of research projects that they, they develop. Uh, there's some guidance, there's some guidelines as to what kinds of projects they can develop, but they're largely in charge of developing their own research project um, and, and bringing forward all of the kind of analytical strategies that we covered in the previous term. So close reading is really kind of the cornerstone of the course. Um, it's what we try to um, get into on day one. It's what we I try to get students to understand really, really quickly. It's it's our primary, it's like our basic unit of analysis is how can we close read whatever objects we're engaging with, whether it be kind of written prose, whether it be a film, whether it be a static image, whether it be um, a scholarly article, whether it be some artifact found in the archives. Um, how can we explicate a text or objects, implicit ideas and meanings through the careful explication of specific and often subtle evidence and details. Um, I know close reading tends to get attached to literary, literary analysis. Um, that shouldn't be surprising, my, my background's in literary anal analysis, uh, and students recognize this relationship as well. Um, but I really try to go out of my way to assure them that that um, composition one and two with me is is not an English class. Uh, it's 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 housed outside of an English department. It's not speaking just to future English majors or um, folks going into the humanities that what we're doing is really providing the 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 analytical toolkit for for whatever they might go into. So what I like about close reading as opposed to just analysis is is it it really emphasizes this idea of close careful explication. And, and I'd like to see them see that as different for, than, than just kind of breaking something down into its smaller parts. It emphasizes the idea that we have to get somewhere through those parts a little bit more. Um, so close reading brings together attention to detail, logical reasoning, and creativity to some degree. Sometimes to make a plausible interpretation, we might have to take a leap of, of um, imagination. Uh, but when I isolate these details for my students, even the, the most STEM-minded of them tend to see that these are attributes that we might all want and benefit from, that it's not just the domain of, of um, English or kind of the humanities. Um, but close reading is not necessarily easy for them to grasp. Uh, it challenges students to slow down. Uh, we live in a time that really prioritizes efficiency and speed and where can I save time? And close reading is fundamentally about slowing down. It challenges students to understand the relationship between reading and writing, um, which I don't think many come into college really appreciating the, the link between those two things, um, that, that good writing habits kind of have to be premised on good reading habits and, and vice versa. Uh, and I like the fact that close reading challenges students to see writing as thinking and as a process of discovery. Um, I'll say a little bit more about this later in the presentation, but so many students come in with the understanding that writing really only ever reflects already produced knowledge, rather than the idea that writing can be a mechanism for knowledge production itself. And we're trying to get students to see that writing is really thinking, thinking is a way of writing, um, writing is a way of thinking, and that we can really kind of get somewhere through this, this process. So unsurprisingly, if this is difficult and if this is kind of new for students to develop these close reading skills, we practice a lot, we workshop a lot, and we do rely on a textbook. Um, and that has some serious kind of limitations, which I would love to hear from you on. Um, so we, we really, I, I, I'm devoted to, the, to writing analytically by David Rosenwasser and Jill Steven. I think it's a fantastic book. Um, even when I don't assign a textbook, that's what I usually go to to kind of, you know, get an excerpt or something. Um, it's a phenomenal writing book. Um, they don't need my plug, but that's what I'm largely working with. Um, but it still is, at the end of the day, a textbook. So I have a question, and please feel free to um, put these in the chat or anything. Please share your own experiences. So whether from personal experience or by your own logical speculation, how engaging do first-year students find a writing textbook, do you think? Not at all. Uh, Lauren, uh, Lauren Mitchell, I'm, I'm going to say, yes, you are absolutely correct. Um, they are like textbooks about how to ride a bike. Yes, 100%, 0%. I am very much appreciating these responses. So um, knowing that this is typically the case, right? Um, you're all absolutely right. So take how students kind of feel about textbooks to begin with. Um, and then that had to come into kind of contact with me adjusting to what it means to teach on a quarter system. 
um, which again, in, in, in 2022, that was my first time teaching on a quarter system. I didn't really appreciate what that meant for timing and pacing and things like this. Um, and so we have to take the, the, the resistance to the textbook with the demands of the quarter term. Um, and that's kind of how I got to what I ended up developing through hypothesis. So a major hurdle, um, a 10 week term flies by and there's little time to ease into the course. Um, there's really no, um, no time to kind of get to know you. We have to kind of hit the ground running uh, and kind of keep running. So this means that, in and this is, was my experience, um, you know, in the fall of 2022, the significance of the first week's readings is competing with the general chaos of the beginning of a new term. So a lot of the readings that I assign in that very first week um, are really kind of essential to developing a solid understanding of what we're going to be trying to do over the course of the two terms. Um, now, don't get me wrong. It's not like I cover them in week one and we never go back to them. They're always being returned to but it seems like there has to be some degree of buy-in right from the beginning, or else even those constant returning to's are not doing what they need to be doing. So this also means that the significance of the first week's readings is competing with first-year students' efforts to orient themselves to a radically new environment. And these together kind of mean that despite my efforts to counter these challenges, which to my credit, I did try to anticipate that first year, um, students just did not retain what it meant to close read or how our textbook supported such processes. So no matter how much I brought us back to certain uh, strategies or heur heuristics in the text, no matter how much we tried to incorporate a vocabulary in our classroom, no matter how much our, our daily assignments and our larger tasks were trying them to do these fundamental things, there was something about it that still just never really clicked and never really retained. And that was something that going into the fall of 2023, I, I really wanted to try to address. So I have another quick question, and if folks can offer some some thoughts in the chat and share, not just with me, but with each other, um, whether with social annotation or by other means, uh, how have you helped students engage with textbooks? All right, fair enough, Vic. Make them intertextual, read against or with something else. Yeah, awesome. Encouraging previewing. These are great ideas. Thank you for sharing these. And I think... Um, I'm coming at this with a very similar, similarly minded as, as you all um, who are sharing these ideas here in, in the workspaces that I developed. Um, oh, that's a great one, uh, Danielle. Uh, application of concept to um, to a real to a real worldish problem. That's great. So I'm not saying this is the solution, but it ended up being a solution for me, um, and I appreciated how much it seemed to help the students as well as kind of push myself. And, and that was kind of important for me too, um, is could I try something that got me out of my comfort zone and, and, and pushed me a little further. So I created these interactive workspaces with hypothesis. And I, I really focused on weeks one, week one's foundational textbook readings. Um, and I turned them into multimodal and interactive workspaces. Now, I only focused on the week one readings because it seemed like week one was where the most kind of noise and distraction existed just in the general course of a new term starting. Um, but it was also week one that it's, it's too much essential real estate. It, it, I can't give that up. We can't just kind of erase the first week as like a get to know you, like it had to be meaningful. So um, I really only focused on the week one readings to see at least in this first year how those would go. So I, using you know, hypothesis, I pre-annotated these textbook readings, again, all coming from writing analytically, in order to um, model effective annotation habits. So, um, you know, in the slide here, the uh, comment is attached to the, the what's highlighted in green. So if something that we're hoping students kind of learn as a, as a solid annotation habit is um, how to recognize important details or information and what it is they're annotating, and are they able to kind of, um, A, flag it as essential and key so that's something they can come back to, and B, kind of discuss its significance, um, you know, that's a, that's a solid engagement with the text. So I'm trying to model that here, where the text is talking about, um, you know, the need to kind of move away from evaluative reactions to um, to, to texts and objects and start by just thinking about what do we see kind of stripped of evaluation. I use the pre-annotations to clarify concepts and content. So something that these early readings I assign discuss is the distinction between inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. 
uh, which are concepts that I found, you know, over the years that um, incoming first year students don't really have a strong sense of. And that's fine. They're really complicated and it's understandable if those don't get discussed in high school. Um, so a good section of, of our early readings kind of focus on the difference between induction and deduction. So in such cases, I might, um, you know, pull out or highlight or kind of elaborate upon something the text is trying to do. And so in this example, I'm trying to explain how if we think about writing as a process um, that occurs at multiple stages and in many different shapes and forms, it's always kind of a shifting between induction and deduction, right? Um, and trying to kind of make them make 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 sense of that process. Um, because these texts kind of cover a lot of ground again in the first week, I also am trying to, in my clarifying, connect how different aspects of the reading kind of relate to each other and try to kind of draw some sense together across these readings or, or that are happening um, within the first few days of the term. Um, I use these pre-annotations to provide contextual materials, and this might seem simple, but um, two things I was trying to accomplish here. So at one point in these early readings, the authors of our textbook discussed two different photographers. Um, and while the textbook itself prompts students to say, hey, go Google these names and see what you can find, um, we all know that students probably aren't going to do that. So I wanted to kind of do two things by providing the contextual information right here in the workspace. One, um, I wanted to kind of limit distractions as much as possible. And if I could kind of actually get students not to move away from the text, that, that was kind of okay right now. And two, I wanted to show them what they could be doing in their own annotations in future assignments, um, that they could get really kind of creative with how they annotate text and in these shared kind of hypothesis spaces. Um, I use the pre-annotations to kind of post course specific writing models. So as much as the textbook does an excellent job of explaining certain strategies or certain exercises or certain heuristics, um, and even provide samples to some degree. I wanted to offer at least some models that were premised on text we'd be reading in class to kind of help fuel discussion, to kind of help them um, contextualize a new strategy in terms that they understand because they're now familiar with this other text. And that's the same kind of thinking behind um, here where I would, I would uh, you know, film quick like kind of uh, screencasts of our screen recordings of me performing certain strategies or heuristics on a course reading, and then I can embed that video right in the workspace. So while the student is reading about here, what writing analytically calls the method, they could be watching a video of me performing the method on one of our course readings. Um, I also use these pre-annotations to kind of uh, highlight continuity between concepts and heuristics. So if a detail that I um, uncovered in a heuristic that, you know, called notice and focus leads to a sample writing that I now produced based on one of those details, I wanted to use this space to draw those connections to the students and kind of make transparent this larger kind of line of thinking or process of thinking that I'm, I'm, I'm introducing to them. Um, I think probably most effectively of, of all of these things, I used the workspaces to invite reflection on past writing instruction and experience. So if um, at any point the texts introduce an idea or a, a way of thinking about writing that um, largely um, kind of diverges from how a student might have been taught previously or is just absolutely new, I try to anticipate that, ask some questions and ask students to kind of link what the text is talking about back to their own prior experiences. Um, what I liked about this and what, what doing this kind of revealed to me after the fact was um, the kind of asynchronicity of the social annotations allow for, I think, a greater degree of honesty in the responses. But at the same time, students could then see that they're not alone. Like so many of the responses were so similar. So many people had very overlapping and similar experiences with pre previous writing and writing instruction. So um, it's kind of a nice balance between inviting honesty and still feeling supported and helping to build community. Um, I use these pre-annotations to um, prompt direct engagement with the text. So at many points throughout the readings, the, the text might kind of describe an exercise or a strategy or a way of doing something, and then immediately say, hey, try this or answer these kinds of questions. The workspaces provided a direct space for them to do that thinking and to share that kind of work and kind of create a greater community involvement with um, tasks that I don't necessarily know that they're doing on their own, but could definitely benefit from doing. 
So some of the results that I found, and I, I don't have formal studies or anything, but this is just based on my perception of things and 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 my seeing how these went for my um for my uh my class. Um, Danielle, I see your question. I'll just pause quick. So do I pre-annotate one time only or for multiple all assignments? So in terms of so the only times I really tried doing these pre-annotations is with our textbook readings. And the way I handled it at least this year, and I might change it going on to next year is um, I did these kind of very involved workspaces just for the first week of reading, but then kind of gradually tapered off the level of my presence in the in the readings after that. So maybe I would pre-annotate for a couple more weeks, but by the middle of the term, I wasn't pre-annotating at all and was hoping that they have kind of now taken ownership of what we were trying to do. So some things I noticed, oh, no problem, Daniel. Some things I noticed. Um, some benefits it enabled much quicker comprehension. And again, I'm only comparing this to one previous year, but it seemed incredibly quickly noticeable to me. Um, compared to prior years, students understood much sooner um, what we meant by close reading and how our textbook provided varying approaches to that task. Um, I'm, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier. I don't think I did. But like writing analytically, which is, again, what we use, it, it never once, I think, mentions the phrase close reading. So we're, I'm really trying to get students to see how um, various strategies and heuristics in our textbook kind of let them do this process we're calling close reading. Um, and that that happened much quicker in the term. Um, it fostered greater retention. So I had students right up through week nine in the previous year still needing a refresher as to what we meant by this um, and, and why, right? And I did not have that anywhere near to the same degree this past year. Um, in composition and research one, so the first course in the sequence, um, I did not have to add uh, much reminders or anything at all. By the second course, students came in just ready to do it, which speaks to my third point here. It increased independent application. So by the time students got to composition and research too, and we were working with archival material from the college archives, um, they were they were instantly applying close reading strategies on their own. Um, it supported student metacognition. I uh, gave out an anonymous survey asking students to reflect on their engagement with these workspaces, and many made comments much like this one um, that. The, the workspaces helped guide my thinking so that on future readings, I knew how to go about my thought process and in interpreting the text. Um, I understand that I wouldn't want anybody thinking that thinking is itself prescriptive, but by no means is that um, the goal here. But for students who are really trying to figure out a, a new way of thinking for many of them, having some extra guidance that early on, I think was helpful. And it's at least drawing attention to their own processes of thinking. And I think that's that's a big win. Um, and finally, it enhanced accessibility. So much of what the workspaces did uh, align with universal design for learning guidelines. And we can kind of look at these briefly. So, um, you know, in terms of engagement, it kind of sat, it kind of meets these guidelines, um, 7.2, 7.3, 8.1 um, in these categories. So in terms of recruiting interest, it invites connection between content and personal experience, and it also limits distraction. In terms of sustaining effort and persistence, um, it clarifies, the workspace is clarified objectives by pre-annotating um, and by inviting peer-to-peer -peer engagement. Uh, it helped provide options for self-regulations because the pre-annotations help promote certain expectations that could then optimize motivation. Uh, in terms of representation, it offered multiple means for perception by offering alternatives for both auditory and visual information. Uh, it offered options for um, language and symbols by clarifying vocabulary, supporting the decoding of text and illustrating through multiple media. It provided uh, options for comprehension by supplying background knowledge, highlighting patterns, critical features. And then in terms of um, action and expression, it provided options for expression and communication um, by providing multiple media and inviting multiple tools for construction and composition. Uh, and it it, satis it helps with executive functioning by modeling uh, iterable steps for future planning and strategy development. There were a few drawbacks that I noticed after doing all this. Um, one was time. Um, the, the workspaces took a significant amount of time to plan, um, to create the component parts and to assemble. Um, that could discourage change. So something I'm very much aware of is that, you know, um, what we do on Hypothesis, our, our annotations can be um, exported and imported. Um, but 
and that's great. And that is a huge time saver. But it, if if you ever want to make a change that now might make some kind of um, piece of infrastructure you've developed no longer relevant, um, and you know the time that's going to have to go into kind of doing that again, it might might discourage change. And I don't know about you all, but I'm somebody who um, I don't think I've ever taught the, the same course exactly the same way twice. Um, I'm always tinkering with something. And even small changes might kind of um, kind of jeopardize or challenge the relevance of some kind of uh, uh, you know guidance or some kind of infrastructure I've developed. Um, there was some redundancy, specifically with the self-reflective questions I asked. So um, many students, when I um, put out that anonymous survey and I asked them to reflect on their experience with these workspaces, uh, many said that while they thought overall the experience is beneficial and these self-reflective questions helpful, so many of them ended up leading to the same question, right? Or excuse me, the same answer. Um, if I'm asking students to reflect on their previous experience, and they're genuinely being confronted with new information, new ways of thinking, new ways of doing things, um, then, you know, there's only so many times you can say, I've never done this before, or I don't, I don't know, I don't have experience with this, before you start to lose sight of the relevance of what you were doing to begin with, right? Bottom line, though, um, from at least my perspective, the workspace is, um, really helps signal the importance of our early readings, concepts, and strategies. And that's kind of what I was hoping for. Like, how do I make it clear to students that what we're doing right now is not just, you know, introductory stuff I can ignore, but is actually really, really important, and I need to be paying attention to this? The workspaces in that week one, like, really seem to help. Um, and I think they did so because they were able to cut through much of the week one noise and chaos. Um, they were largely successful in terms of student engagement and learning. I, I got nothing but really positive feedback requests for more of them to be developed. Um, and really the, 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 the main criticisms were the number of self-reflective questions I asked and the redundancy of the answers. And that's totally fair and valid. And I can rethink how I ask questions like that. Or I could even just, you know, say, I'm going to ask you 10 questions in the course of this reading. You only have to answer five of them or something. Um, but I think the biggest maybe not the biggest, but a significant, you know, um, benefit to this was that creating the workspaces was beneficial for me, despite the time and labor. Um, we spend a lot of time discussing the ways in which what we do is helpful for our students, but I also want to emphasize that this was really helpful for me. Um, if I want to sell to my students the idea that thinking is writing and writing is thinking, it took creating these workspaces for me to really get to a solution um, to the problem that inspired their creation to begin with. Um, I think we are almost out of time. That was my last slide, but does anybody have like a question I could address quick or something they want to share quick? Well, thank you very much for attending. This was uh, an excellent opportunity to share some of what I've been doing with you. And if anybody would like to talk more or share ideas or share experiences, please feel free to contact me. Um, I just hope you uh, have a, a great rest of your day and enjoy the rest of the sessions.